Are we on? We are live right now. Good. So I'll, I'll start. Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, first Google Hangout of Asset Pricing One. Uh, I hope this is going to be an interesting quarter, and this is an opportunity for us to get to know each other a little bit and also uh, clear up uh, interesting things regarding specifically regarding that week's material. But it never ends up that way. We always wind up in uh, longer, larger philosophical discussions. So first, I'd like to introduce to everyone our team here, uh, Adam and Nina. Why don't, Adam and Nina, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Adam also uh, turn the camera and introduce Emily, who's behind the scenes and, and the only reason that this whole ship keeps running. <laughs> so start with Adam. Yes. Well, my name is Adam. I am a third-year PhD student in financial economics here at the University of Chicago. And I took the, both the offline and the online course last year, and I really loved it. Um, and I'm happy to be on the team this year again. And by my right side is Emily. Hi. <laughs> Emily is the mastermind behind all the, <laughs> all the technique. The course, please. And Nina. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Nina. Uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student in finance at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. I took this uh, great course one and a half years ago, and um, it was one of the greatest courses I ever took in my life. I enjoyed it a lot, and um, the Google Hangouts have been uh, in this course uh, then as well, and uh, for me it was uh, the great experience, the great chance to ask questions and, and get uh, answers on them. And I hope you guys really enjoyed. And uh, um, I'm glad to see uh, you here. Yep. OK, great. Uh, I think we should get right to work. Um, we asked Adam and Nina to, to sort through some questions and tee up some good ones. And then the flow will be where we're going to try to follow in real time if you have a follow up follow-ups to things we're talking about, and then we'll move on to the next question. OK, uh, Adam, Nina, who's, who's got a good question for me? Yes. So the first question okay. comes oh. from Ricardo. Ricardo asks, there are three views on asset pricing. And economics accounting view, the one that's taught here, past values of the asset itself determines the present value of such an asset. Or the money view, liquidity in the economy, stock availability, supply and demand, strengthens the present value of, of the asset. And then there's the, the finance view. Present value of an asset is equal to forthcoming net cash flows plus uh, endogenous salvage value of all the, the cash flows discounted at an opportunity risk rate. Um, and then he asks, are we devoted to one of these views in particular, and, and, and why, why is that the case? Um, the one thing I, I wanted to emphasize, which, which you started with, uh, when you send us questions, do do give us a, a line or two about who you are and where you are. Uh, you know, one interesting thing about you to make this a little bit more personal. So, hi, Ricardo, wherever you are. Um, boy, that's a deep question. Uh, one way I could answer that is um, in this class, or in, in you, I'm trying to expound. Price is always discounted present value of future earnings. The question is using what discount rate? Uh, so one way to frame your question is which of these, each of the three classes of, of, of thinking you talked about are different ways of thinking about the discount rate. So um, let me frame it that way. Um, I would say way one of looking at the discount rate, the accounting way, is discount rates should be constant. That sort of gives you book value. So price is constantly discounted expected cash flows. Um, but then, we, of course, discount rates aren't constant. So we might take the second view, uh, sort of this class's view. Uh, let's start with the next level. Price is discounted expected future cash flows, but with a discount rate that can vary over time. Um, and our, our first, we always in economics, the, the best kind of economics, you start with supply and demand and, and frictionless markets, and you add frictions as you need them. So sort of the second step here would be price is expected discounted cash flows, but um, risk premiums can vary over time because macroeconomic conditions can vary over time. So then, then we start to build in uh, a model of uh, the simplest model that we're talking about in this class is one, it's not the simplest, it's the second most complicated. The simplest model is constant discount rate. 
Second most simplest model is the, like the consumption-based model. Well, macroeconomic conditions vary over time, so discount rates can vary over time. Then the third most complicated, now, now you, and you mentioned some great stuff, monetary, liquidity, um, assets have a fundamental value, and then they may have a liquidity value, like, like money. People are willing to hold money even, even though it doesn't pay anything. It's a prime liquidity value. But we layer on liquidity value, sure, we probably won't get there, except the Google Hangouts, but there's liquidity value. I mean, right now in the news where the ECB is trying quantitative easing, which the Fed tried, what's that about? Well, there's something, there's some liquidity value that they think that they can affect, exactly. And on top of that, I would say, um, as liquidity values and, and segmented markets, those are all theories of a discount rate, really, that don't track back to macroeconomics. They track back to frictions in the financial markets. And you could add on that bubbles and sunspots and so forth. Now, it's kind of interesting in, in, in monetary economics. When we think about the ECB and, and, and what the Swiss National Bank did recently, it uh, must have been fun for Nina, whose bank account just went up 20% overnight <laughs> relative to euros. Um, there, monetary economics people often talk about the liquidity value without thinking about the fundamental value. And I, and I think uh, a lot of the theories we're talking about would be good. What, what my research is, is to bring some of asset pricing back to monetary economics, to start with the basic value and then add the liquidity. So, uh, boy, um, there's a tendency of these questions to lead to lectures, which I have to apologize for. But that was such a deep question. So let, let me try to summarize that. There are three big views. Uh, fundamental values with discount rates that don't vary over time. Fundamental values that allow discount rates to vary over time for sort of macroeconomic large-scale effects. Uh, price is present value, but the discount rate is moved a lot by liquidity or financial frictions. And then bubbles, sunspots, uh, other weird stuff like that. And I think good finance kind of proceeds in this direction, never losing sight of the foundations. So a lot of what you read about finance talks about the liquidity values with it and forgets about the fundamental values. How did I do, guys? Uh, you did well. <laughs> okay. Now, what was not clear? Adam, Nina, you want to follow up on that uh, that little lecture? No, I, I I guess one of the things that confused me when I took the class the first year was that when we um, when we price assets, sometimes we do that. Using other assets as the input, and we think that we can we can uh, calculate the price of a call option using other using the price of a stock or a bond, without actually modeling why does this stock has have have this this value in the in the first place. So so are, are those two views sort of disconnected? Is there a uh, is it better or worse to think about the fundamental value of a stock, or is it okay to, to take as given the value of a stock and a bond if the only thing you want to know is what's the price of, of a call option? Did you want to say just give the absolute versus relative pricing lecture? Is that what you... <laughs> uh, yes, so um, asset pricing is that's a, that's an excellent way of teeing up the lecture you wanted to hear. Asset pricing is a very practical discipline, and so the approach you depends on the problem you have at hand. So um, a lot of asset pricing, and, and you're very, it's very good that you mentioned, we tend to go into hours and hours of lecture without saying why we're doing what we're doing. <laughs> so we, we, you know, we start the Black-Scholes theory. Okay, we're going to price the stock, the option in terms of the stock and bond, and now equations fill the board. But why? Are you pricing the option in terms of the stock and bond? What happened to the consumption, right? Okay, so it depends on the problem you have at hand. We, we develop, if you want to uh, meet with your graduate students and have a beer and argue about our markets rational or irrational, for that you need to tie asset pricing to macroeconomics and, and adopt a more fundamental approach. If you want to think about general equilibrium questions, so. Uh, um, you know how well. How does the federal? How does quantitative easing affect asset pricing? We need a, a sort of a fundamental approach that writes down the economics. If you are sitting in the bowels of an investment bank and your boss said, "Okay, we have this huge portfolio of Swiss francs. Uh, no, we're short Swiss francs, and we want to know what happens tomorrow if the S and P uh, 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 changes the cut, ch changes the the peg to the euro." 
you don't really need to know consumption, risk premium, stuff like that. You need a, a more financial engineering thing. You need to know how much, when the Swiss franc changes, how much does my portfolio change? And you don't really need to get deep into the, the economics of it. You, you need more of the one asset in terms of another asset. And we do a lot of that one asset in terms of another asset because so much of the use of finance in practice is exactly, you know, if you go to a bank, it's about pricing one thing in terms of another thing. They don't really care about the deep economics of stuff. Well, maybe they ought to, but so pay attention to the question you're asking and then which form of answer will be, will, will be clear. Absolute pricing is kind of like the deep pricing, relative pricing is one thing in terms of another. They're both right if they're right for the question you're asking. Nina, did you have something to add there? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, I just saw the camera go to you, so I thought you were, you were sniffling or something. <laughs> Follow on or, or more uh, on to the next question? I, I see now a question which would be good uh, as a starting question in general. Um, Gui King Chao asks, uh, says, uh, that he is very intrigued uh, with the general ideas of the course and he has background in banking and he wants to um, discuss the goals and benefits of this course and where it will lead to and he is sure that by the end of the class these questions would become clear but some early motivations would be helpful. I would say that last sentence again. Um, He's sure that by the end of the class, these questions would become clear, but some early motivations would be helpful. Yeah, gee, I don't know. Um, actually, and that does remind me, both Adam and Nina, a lot of your job is, I, I'm so old, I've been at this so long, I've forgotten what's confusing. Uh, and, and you guys remember what it was that last year or two years ago was confusing to you. So help, help, help us all by remembering what's confusing. and. And these goals things are special. I, like Adam's question was great. It's clear you sat in a class and you didn't know why the heck you were doing some model, uh, which I think is sort of what GUI is asking too. Um, now let me give the bad answer to this. Look, guys, this is what I know how to do. So <laughs> it's useful for it's really useful for being a finance professor. Uh, that's not that's not a good answer. Um, my goals. Um, let me try to state something a little uh, better. Um, there is this thing, academic uh, asset pricing, which is a combination of theory and facts about the world that has been developed in professional journals for 30 years. It is a, a scientific approach, and I, I, I don't mean that to pat ourselves on the back. I mean, really, we, we look at data on asset markets and, and on the people who do asset markets, data on, on investment management, and, and we sort of do the best we can to apply scientific method to those with, with a theory in mind to organize the, organize the sex. People have been at this for 34 years. They publish stuff in the Journal of Finance. Uh, and I think we've learned something. And our job is to bring that body of knowledge to you, uh, to digest it and, and bring you up to date as, as, as much as possible, and to open the door. After this class, Certainly, just about everything I tell you is, is going to be wrong in some sense, but I don't know which part is wrong. But after this class, you'll be able to read the Journal of Finance and, and find, read the new papers that show what parts of this are wrong and, and how to make it better. So it, open the door to academic finance, uh, I would say, is the way. And, and this has, in the past, proved immensely valuable. Um, it, in, in just about every financial decision, being able to go back to the beginning and think what's the basic principle and, and know some of the facts. What have we learned about this fact in the, in the background I think is helpful. I'll, I'll give you one example. Just last week I was talking to, to some people at one of the tech companies out in California and, and they had this question, they have billions and billions of dollars sitting around and they asked me, so what do we do with these billions of dollars? Well, okay, here's a practical question. Now what could I bring to that practical question from having taught this class? Well, guys, there's the Modigliani-Miller theorem that says money in the corporation and out of the corporation is exactly the same. Why don't you pay it back to the shareholders? They, they had thought about all these things, but it's, you know. Uh, then we thought about, well, maybe there's some shadow value of some constraint of having it in versus outside. Then we thought about thinking about the, the corporation as an investment vehicle. 
So then I apply the standard portfolio theory. The portfolio theory we'll do in the last class says, well, if you have one big investment in some tech projects, maybe your portfolio should diversify. So we talked about how to optimally diversify, which they hadn't even thought about. And they were thinking about sort of mean variance. And I said, well, how about long run mean variance? So the principles that we have developed in academic finance are sort of the bedrock of how you think about practical problems. I guess that's the best advertisement I can give. Adamina, why should they study this class? It's going to be a long, hard quarter, so let's have some rah-rah. It, it is going to be a long, hard quarter. And, and I think that's one of the things that's, that's important to say early on. This is a PhD-level class. And, but even if you don't, so, so if you want to take all the quizzes and all the homeworks, it really requires a lot of work. But that doesn't mean that, that if you only follow the lectures that you don't, that you won't get a lot out of the class. I, I think that that's one of the beauties about Coursera, that you can sort of target it to, to how many hours a week you want to spend. Um, some of the questions that, that we often get is, what's, what's the required level of math that you need to, to, to understand or to follow the, the lectures. Um, so, so I guess one question would be if there are students out there who don't feel that, that they have the required math or linear algebra or regression analysis to do a PhD level course, can they still take away in sort of intuitive uh, answers from, from this class as well? Or would you recommend them to, to take linear algebra classes on Coursera and then come back and and do the class again next year. No, this is good. Thank you for bringing that up because uh, this comes up. And what we discovered last year in teaching this class, and, and the way we've revamped it a little this year, is is designed it to be accessible on many levels. So lots and lots of people told me last year that they liked watching the videos and they didn't have time for the quizzes and homeworks. Great. Uh, I think the videos are quite self-contained, and you can get a lot out of them. And that's. Um, both people don't know anything about the subject, but also uh, a surprising number of academics, um, people who are economists, like may maybe macroeconomists who didn't know any finance, said, this was great. I just watched these videos on the plane, and I didn't do any of the quizzes and homeworks, and, and they got a lot out of that. Uh, level two is uh, watch the videos and do the quizzes. The quizzes are designed to be uh, easier, straightforward, uh, um, uh, reinforcing the uh, reinforcing the, the uh, what's in the um, lectures and in the readings, and then step three, do the actual homeworks, which require a certain amount of thinking. I think you get a lot more out of it if you do everything, uh, but I think you can do uh, you can do it at whatever level you like. The math is not that hard. Uh, actually, finance it has this math uh, reputation. The actual math is sort of basic, standard, mid-level undergraduate math, at least in any respectable country, um, <laughs> which may not be the um, US. But uh, what's finance is, is very much um, thinking quantitatively is hard, mapping the world into, into the math. What are the lessons for the math? What's the intuition of the math? Staring at equations. And, and seeing the beautiful picture that they that they paint, that's the hard part in, in this class. And that's why all this chit chat, I think, is useful. How are we doing? Nina, do you have something to add? Yeah, yeah I have yes, something to add. So before this class, I took different courses in finance. And for me, um, this was a chance to get a deeper understanding of basics and why do we study. And um, I remember that. My um, my inference is that that the aim of this course is to understand why prices for different uh, things are different in cross section and one, why they change over time. And when I realized that, I was thinking that it applies to anything in the world. When I go to the cafeteria, then I was thinking, okay, why this menu costs more than this menu, that there are factors behind that. And this menu one year ago uh, was, I don't know, one franc cheaper, so why it's now one franc more expensive? And then I started thinking in those terms um, when I was buying anything or thinking of price of anything. So that's just, um, that's what I want to add. Well, Nina, you, you've, you've had, I can sense this conversion of experience. You started thinking like an economist. 
which is really what we're doing. This is a very simple supply and demand economics uh, applied to the world of finance. But uh, it turns out simple supply and demand economics is, is unexpected and, and leads to all sorts of uh, interesting things. Now, just be aware that most of the people around you don't think like economists. They're nuts at cocktail parties. Let's go on. Uh, what, what do we got next for a quick? Oh, but on, on the technique level, uh, if you're surviving this week, uh, it's not going to get any harder. Uh, in, and in some sense, this is the weed out week. We just jumped into, we did in one week, uh, what, a quarter and a half worth of time series material. Uh, so this was, this was an action packed and, and fairly mathematical week. But we're not going to use any big tools other than stuff we've already used this week. But lots more intuition in economics. That's what's coming. Next week is the exciting week. So I hope everyone sticks with us through next week. Okay, what do we got for questions? Good. We have a question from David Chutsiki. And he asks about sort of a question of how to apply this course uh, on a personal finance level. He's read the, the classic Pharma French paper. And he finds that the, the, the two takeaways one is that value stocks do better than, than growth stocks, and the other is that there's a, a premium on, on stocks with high beta. So how can he apply those lessons if he wants to invest? Can, should he uh, uh, sort of invest in, in, in companies that his own human capital is, is uh, uh, negatively or, or highly negatively correlated with? Or, and and for, for high beta stocks, he, it might be difficult as a retail investor to lever up, uh, so, so how can he gain exposure to, to that? Are there, are there good stocks uh, with, a, with a high leverage or, or a high beta? Would, would, would those be a good idea to invest in? That's, this is great. Um, so I do have to make a disclaimer. This is not a class in personal investing or how to get rich in the market <laughs> or how to trade stocks for fun and, and pleasure. In, in some sense, we can, I can give you the answer. Open market portfolio, Vanguard Total Market Index. See you later. <laughs> uh, now, that's not just a joke. The average investor holds the market portfolio. That's like a deep theorem that's going to underlie our portfolio. Theory. So we can do anything. We have to think about the average. So we will come back to, we will do portfolio theory towards the end of the class. Uh, I hate to put you off for 12 weeks, but I think it's important to survey uh, the, the understanding why prices are what they are before you talk about what you should buy and sell. So uh, I do think the class is useful for personal investing, for money management, for, for what we do. Uh, you mentioned a couple of the anomalies that we'll talk about. Uh, value stocks do better than growth stocks in some sense. Uh, yeah, there's this beta anomaly. There's this whole slew of anomalies, and how do you think about them? But and, and the approach we're going to take when we do portfolio theory is, wait a minute, the average investor has to hold the market portfolio. So for everybody who buys value stocks and says, wow, that's a great deal, somebody has to be underweighting value stocks. So why do you, uh, David, think that you know you get to get this greater return? It's a zero-sum game. Anything other than hold the market is a zero-sum game. So why should you buy value? For you to buy value and get a better return, somebody should be buying growth and getting a worse return. For you to buy the high beta stocks, somebody needs to be buying the low beta stocks. So why, why are you different from everybody else? I think is that's an important way, standard way of looking at it. Just says, oh, here's these all these opportunities. Why don't you take them? And implicitly, everyone else is just too dumb. Uh, I don't think everyone is too dumb. You know, not everyone can be smarter than average. Um, so I think um, thinking about how you're different from other people is a very productive uh, way of, of doing things and understanding why prices are where they, where they are. If value stocks look like a great opportunity, I think it's good to stop before you say let's invest. Uh, stop and think about why everybody else isn't investing. How is it that the market stopped in an equilibrium where value stocks are, are undervalued? Now, maybe you'll just find that you, you know when you think about that, sure, this is something I can do that nobody else thought of doing. Or maybe you'll find there's there's some embedded risk. So I think, uh, uh, but just by asking the question, you almost got to the answer, and that is the approach we'll take. And I think I think understanding why values are what they are, having a framework for it, and then we'll go through the portfolio theory towards the end. 
how should you think about these questions? I, I think that's a good foundation, certainly for at least for not. Number one is don't screw up. Don't do something stupid. So I won't give you great secrets of investing success. How to find the next? How, how to be ahead of the Swiss National Bank? How to find the next uh, you know, huge internet uh, startup? But certainly we can avoid uh, classic mistakes of, of portfolio investing. Uh, classic mistakes like looking at investments in isolation rather than as part of a portfolio, uh, looking at um, one period results rather than long term results. Uh, so I think it'll be useful for that. Uh, although I should admit, uh, I don't do a lot of buying and selling. But anyway, uh, <laughs> maybe you guys will. Adam Nina, you want to help me out on this one? I think it's a good approach to, to, to think of the market as a, as a zero-sum game, everything that's away from the market, somebody else is on the other side of. Um, one aspect might be, well, I'm a lot younger than you, John. So, so cap, cap, cap C, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but my cap C might be, be higher than yours. Should I have a different portfolio than you? Or or do we think that, that we should just both have the same tangent portfolio? Yeah, so we should advertise the class. Um, <clears throat> then once you state something like that, now we have a portfolio theory and we can work it out and we can talk about what are the assumptions, what do we need to know about the world. Should younger people hold something different from older people? Should somebody who has a, uh, uh, a house, you know, a house which is a, a very big lumpy investment invest their portfolios differently? Which kinds of who is it that can bear which kinds of risks and, and can't bear other kinds of risks? Uh, maybe try to understand uh, that there are market frictions. So maybe this beta stuff does uh, there is some limit on leverage, and and maybe that leads you to uh, I should start a business to help people invest in high leverage securities. Find find something where the market's wrong. So reducing it to questions that are answered. You know we can show you the questions we know how to answer. And, and the portfolio theory we know, and at least reducing uh, a, a big thing to something with a, an if and a then um, in standard portfolio theory helps you think about those questions. But we should say, this is not a how to pick stocks class. Where there's never going to be a class that says, OK, now here's how you look at the balance sheet, and here's how you talk to your buddy, and here's the right cocktail parties to go to, and, and, and buy and sell them tomorrow. That's just, that way we're here for the economic understanding of asset markets, which is partly the, the portfolio theory that we know, uh, and partly all the strange facts in the markets around us, partly this approach to try to understand why prices are where they are before you buy. It's not like going down to the grocery store where you can just say, whoa, strawberries are cheap today. It's, it's, it's better in finance to understand why strawberries seem to be cheap before you buy a lot of strawberries. Nina? Yep, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> we've, uh, we've got a Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was about to suggest to go to the next question. Okay, good. And uh, in the future, let me just remind everybody, tell us not just your name, but where you are and one, one line about uh, who you are and, what, and you know, something the rest of us might find interesting. Okay, but people, right, we're not doing that now because the questions that came in didn't have that yet. Okay, next question. Nina, maybe you, you have one? Yeah. So there is a question from Flavio Nardi. Uh, he's um, a PhD student in finance in Australia National University. He has a question regarding return predictability, specifically the regression of stock return on the previous uh, dividend yield. Uh, that the fact that the left-hand side variable, uh, PT plus 1 minus PT divided on PT, shares the same denominator as the right-hand side variable, DT over PT. Uh, does this create an issue in the regression, like built-in correlation? Also, since the dividend time series is typically very persistent, isn't all variation coming from 1 over PT? And he um, cites a paper, um, The Myth of Long Horizon Predictability. This is great. And, and by the way, we should, uh, for the first week, it's OK to have big philosophical discussions, but we should. Uh, uh, talk to some extent about the material in the actual class uh, on occasion. Um, so, uh, and, and next week, the first thing we're de delving into is this uh, dividend yield predictability. And so I, it looks like Flavio's already reading ahead, and, and it must be in the middle of the night in Australia. 
Um, so, uh, to, so the, we have regressions. We have these return regressions. A return t plus 1 on dividend yield at time t. And as Flavia pointed out, hey, we got the same var There's a, a pt on both left and right. Is that a problem? Uh, not necessarily. So let's just review. What, what does a regression have to have? A regression has to have errors that are uncorrelated with right-hand variables. So I was long, at forecasting regression, something seen at time t uh, is uncorrelated with the forecast error from t to t plus 1. So in a forecasting regression, uh, ret uh, return t plus 1. I mean, yeah, I'm going to try some technology here. Uh, RT plus 1 is A plus B. XT plus error T plus 1. Here is a uh, here is a return forecasting regression. How are we doing, guys? Yeah. I fine. failed on the fancy technology uh, last night that I was supposed to put in. Okay, so there's our regression, right? So now what does a regression like that mean? Well, the number one thing that it needs is that uh, this right-hand variable X is uncorrelated with that error. And in the in this context, what so f optimal forecasts are uncorrelated with forecast errors. So that's kind of that's kind of cool. That's why um, that's why we run these things this way. The, the, you know, the, the the forecast error is uncorrelated with the forecast. Well, what we need is for x t to be observed at time t. So that's important. People have to be able to see x t, uh, and then um, if returns are not forecastable, then then that's a fine regression. Now, Flavia does have a good point. I mean, there, there is this. Let me let me do a uh, let's see. Uh, Sorry, I'm going to write uh, the uh, PT is A plus B uh, DT over PT plus error T plus 1. So the second equation, that's uh, I wrote out what a return is. And you can see the problem. We seem to have a P on both sides. Mm. Does that cause a problem? Why would that cause a problem? Well, I think the answer where that would cause a problem is measurement error. Uh, and the, there is, uh, you'll see as we do these return forecasting uh, regressions, a lot of concern about measurement there. And uh, now I'm going to make a little graph. Um, so here's a graph of a hypothetical price path. Right? So prices are rising over time, and I drew in a measurement there. That, that price was just written down wrong. Now, if you have a series like that with measurement there, you can see what that's going to induce is an artificial predictability. You're going to say, hey, wow, a big increase in price yesterday predicts a decline in price today. And, and that's an example of Flavio's problem because we're using the same price, that price there. We're using that to compute the forecasting variable. That's being used as the X over on this side and also the return going forward. Right? So there you see, because we're using the same P in the X part and in the return going forward, you're inducing a measurement, you're inducing an error. You're inducing the appearance. It looks like price going up here leads to price going down, but that's, that's really false. But that's a problem of measurement there. It's not a problem in the theory of the regression. If, if things are measured perfectly, then there would be nothing wrong with using the same P on both the right and the left. So we do a lot to work. One of the big things we tend to do to avoid that problem is, is we, intent, we tend to put in a lag. Don't use the exact same P on both sides. Maybe you should lag this uh, one month so that, you're, so that uh, that price there uh, isn't exactly the same price as you're using to compute the return. So for example, momentum, you'll often see that we lag the X variable one month to avoid uh, this, this problem of using exactly the same price. But the, the issue is measurement there are not something deeply wrong with the regressions. Guys, how am I doing? Adam, Nina, can you think of anything else that needs to be said? These return forecasting regressions are very, uh, very subtle. They look so simple, but they're very subtle. We have another question on precisely that. It comes from Brian. Brian is a software developer with a math modeling stats background in, in engineering and science, and he's currently working on an iPhone app called uh, Stock Touch. So he's been reading slightly ahead as well, and, and, and he's interested in, in this idea of dividend yield being a good predictor of, of future returns. And, and he's asking a, a series of questions basically on, on sort of the intuition of this. Are there papers or studies of whether this is more pronounced in some sectors than others? Um, are there 
do you think that you could you comment on whether sort of there are high flyer companies like Amazon that that don't grant any dividends and seem to plow a lot of their resources back into the business and yet they have still high returns? Maybe this is the same for, for, for Google. Um, do you think there's there might be he asks if um, if there's an like an upper bound and upper limit to this effect? Um, yeah, so, so those are all sort of questions related to how to, to pick stocks based on, on the, whether dividend yield is a good predictor of future returns. Yes, and, and <clears throat> let me remind everybody to how to pick stocks. Another way of uh, stating this is how to isolate stocks where the market equilibrium has, conceded, has concluded that they're low risk so that they have low or high returns. Uh, um, just because uh, something has a high expected return doesn't mean you want to buy it, right? It might mean that there's a risk out there that is keeping everyone else from buying it. That's sort of like the number one tension here is the, the there's an underappreciated opportunity versus where's risk and return. Um, so Brian, uh, excellent. And by the way, knowing who people are, I think find, is going to be useful for us to uh, kind of you know think about what kinds of answers and things to do for you. Um, so when we're doing the dividend yield, I, I did the dividend yield as a tip of an iceberg, as a simple illustrating example, not as the way to forecast stock returns. And we need to understand that. <clears throat> so we're looking at one simple example that we can explore in one week. Uh, and then the literature takes off from this and does hundreds and hundreds of other variables, other ways of doing it. Um, and, and we're, we'll survey some of that as the class goes on, but we're not going to do it all uh, in many of the ways that, that Brian suggested. Um, so one, one uh, question is, it, does this hold in other countries and other time periods? Yes. Um, Peter Kujis, who's uh, here at Stanford where I am right now, uh, just sent me a paper from, uh, you know, he, he did this on data from the 1600s. Dividend yield regression works exactly the same as it does for the U.S., so that's kind of nice to know. Uh, when, when we start looking at cross-section, at individual, so what we're doing is dividend yield market over time. One thing that's happened is, of course, people have used hundreds of other variables to forecast the market return. Dividend yield is only the beginning there. Um, Schiller likes price earnings ratios. That works about the same way. Uh, term premium, volatility, all sorts of variables help to forecast the market return. Um, the consumption to wealth ratio is an important one that uh, Martin Letow, Letow said he Ludwig's in a working on. So number one direction of generalization is lots more things forecast the market return. Just because we're using the dividend yield, we're using the simple example. We're not saying this is the best way to do it. Now let's go cross-sectionally. You're looking at one kind of stock versus another kind of stock. That's what Brian was asking about. Here, uh, cross-sectionally, we typically don't use dividend yields because, as Brian pointed out, lots of companies don't pay dividends. So you do price divided by dividend for Amazon, and you got price divided by zero, you got a problem here. So when looking across uh, uh, different companies, that's why Fama and French tend to use the book to market ratio. Uh, and that is, uh, that, that's, it's very similar. A uh, market is, has market price in there. And I, I forget, was it, uh, oh no, it was the previous question we asked, isn't this all the one over price effect that I forgot to answer? Yes, basically what we're doing here is one over price. And anything that has one over price in it is the most important forecaster. Uh, so uh, you know that's why you use price earnings ratios or book to market ratios. Those are better ways of getting one over price. Now, now I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a digression, but I, I had to answer that question. Why is one over price? It was, to say it's all one over price it is the is the advantage. Um, investors who demand a high expected return for something, they look at something, they say, "Oh my God, it's risky." The price goes, they say, I'm not buying it, the price goes down, and you see, you see from that the high risk premium involved. So looking at prices is a way for you in the data to infer what other investors know in the market. One over price is a good thing, it's not a bad thing. But then we go on past one over price. So cross-sectionally, uh, we start with book to market ratios, which is a better way of doing one over price for different companies. That's the value effect. So this, this return prediction from dividend yields in the time series is exactly the same thing as high uh, market values relative to book values. That, that's like price, dividend, market value, book value. That I, isolates return uh, prediction in the cross-section. It's the same uh, phenomenon. 
And in the cross section, as in the time series, people have looked at many, many, many other variables that help to forecast returns. Uh, I think the latest count was in the published literature, 347, if I remember correctly, is Cam Harvey's uh, summary of the number of variables used to forecast returns. Clearly, a lot of that's spurious. And where we are right now in research is trying to, to, to get this zoo of variables back under control and, and understand what's fishing and, and what's real in, in the variation expected returns. So did I answer Brian well enough? Part of what you guys have to do is, is keep track of did I actually answer the question <laughs> along the way in the usual John sermons. Brian also asks if, if since dividends are directly controlled by the board of directors, do we think that maybe if, if the board of directors sort of expects that a large part of the investors know about this relationship, do you think that they can game the system? So once they, they, they realize this relationship, can they sort of possibly break the relationship in the future? Brian is, is thinking of, of recent reports of the IBM focusing efforts on, on share price growth mechanisms or targets. Um, possibly at the expense of their core business uh, viability? Yeah. Uh, so dividends, um, this is a very good question because there's some accounting things involved. When we use dividends, both in the theory and in the data you're using this week, we're not just including cash dividends. We're including all cash payments to investors. So for example, if you used to have a little iPhone, say, startup <laughs> app, you're not planning on paying anybody dividends. What you're planning on is Google buys you out for gazillions of dollars. Now, that, that uh, cash payment to investors counts as a dividend. Uh, that, that, you know, dividend, investors pay a price and they get something back from the company. So uh, anytime the company uh, uses, gives cash to the investors, it might be in a big lump sum at the end when the company is sold, but that counts as a dividend in the data uh, as, as, as well as conceptually. Because eventually, money's got to flow out of the corporation to investors somehow. Uh, so. Uh, the, the present value of earnings and the present value of dividends have to be the same. Uh, you know, it, it, if the company takes earnings and reinvests them in the company, that makes the company more worthwhile. There's more stuff there, but eventually, uh, either that company pays some cash to shareholders, or that company gets sold to a larger company and the shareholders get cash. If the shareholders never ever get any cash out of the company ever, then the share is worthless. So, uh, in some sense, there's some timing questions. If, if a comp that's why we tend not to use actual dividends looking at individual companies. And we use dividends looking at the market as a whole. But individual companies, yeah, you can, you can keep those dividends in the company for a long, long time, but eventually they go out to shareholders. And, and price is present value of dividends in that sense. That is correct, even for companies that don't uh, pay dividends. They say the management might not pay the dividends. That, that's a good point. Um, if management chooses not to pay dividends and instead reinvests it in the company, well, there's, there's value there that eventually will get out to the shareholders. If the management chooses not to pay dividends but instead says, let's fly everyone on private planes down to Costa Rica, uh, now we're, we're, <laughs> we're lowering the value of the company. And, and that should show up in a lower stock price. And that's why companies, uh, that's why uh, there are shareholders. Shareholders have the right to vote out the board of directors and put in a new board of directors. And that's really where uh, where the discipline comes from eventually. But that's verging into corporate finance, which I, I shouldn't do. I, I remind you, part of what you guys have to make sure is that I actually answer the question. <laughs> yeah. Or, anything to chime in there? Um, no. I think that it would be great if we continue because so far we have managed only five questions and, uh, okay. time, and there are much more left. Okay. So, 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 yeah. Uh, the next question is uh, from Marco Aurelio dos Santos, who is a PhD student in accounting and finance at the University of San Paulo. And he would like to ask more about how econometric models can include bounded rationality, uh, considering application in emerging markets, which have different cultural and institutional factors, and considering the 2008 financial crisis. His research analyzes how behavioral factors and institutional factors impact uh, evolution and dynamics of financial markets, and he compares different scenarios, focusing in quantitative and dynamic analysis. And he sends Abracos from Brazil. Abracos from, I'm pronouncing that terribly. I, okay, I don't. 
Okay, that's a great question. Um, there is, and I should say something about all this. Um, so this course and, and, and my own research has not done much uh, bounded rationality, behavioral, finance, cultural factors, and so forth. Um, in part because I, I find that uh, utility maximization and general equilibrium is so flexible <laughs> that it's hard enough to get uh, uh, solid models out before we start throwing in uh, all, all this other stuff. Um, I haven't even kept up with, so, so within the expected utility tradition, there is the uh, recursive utility, um, the Epstein-Zinn stuff, there is the stuff that uh, Lars Hansen uh, in particular is, is doing these days on, um, on, on robust control theory and ambiguity uh, and, and the difficulty people have in, in actually making expectations. Well, what I like about that stuff is it, it writes down models that you can talk about what the predictions are. The trouble with so much, um, I think bounded rationality is fascinating, and, and so are these, some of the other behavioral stuffs, but it's been very resistant to writing down models as opposed to, oh, well, here's a puzzle, gee, people must be nuts. Uh, or we, we, um, there's, a, there's a big distinction between trying to make it look like physics. <laughs> where we write things down and the models have predictions and you test the predictions, and becoming an interpretive discipline, where we sort of see stuff and we paint a pretty picture. Well, there's this thing, and, and let's paint a picture. Uh, oh, this, this is because of cultural things. Ah, my own tastes are that that's, in some sense, it may be very pretty, but it's in some sense too easy. I, I keep my tours to art museums uh, to, to the weekends. Um, but I would pose that as a challenge. Uh, how do you make that stuff, that approach, more than interpretive? I actually, I think there is a, a great future for it, but when it can be turned into something, something modelable, a bounded rationality, there's something deep about what we, we just can't compute very quickly, and that must affect our decisions. Um, but I do, I, I would like to push back a little bit on the, um, in some sense, the world is all the same, you know? Yeah, there's a crisis uh, in, in Latin America. Well, but in some sense, you look over history and, and crises are all the same. <laughs> there's these fundamental features of it that just don't, there's nothing special about Latin American culture that leads to currency crises because uh, lots of other countries have had currency crises that look exactly the same. So I, I, my own approach has been to look for those things instead. Anyway. Yeah, I'm just kind of waffling because you're not going to get much help, but at least you'll find see how the other approach lives. Okay, let's go on to another one. Good. We yeah. have answering. Ha. We we have a question from uh, Sing Feng. It says, "Hi, professor. I have two questions. Question one: Why forecasting power of some predictors can exist for such a long time? If the market can be predicted by some factors, there are opportunities exposed to investors." The opportunities will vanish once people take advantage of them. But what keeps investors from using the opportunities to make profits? And then he has a second question. He asks, how can we understand unconditional mean? I know sometime we calculate it by sample mean. Is that all? What's the difference between what's the difference between theoretical and empirical work in understanding what the unconditional mean is? You should know by now, Adam, the, the danger of asking me two questions at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, first and foremost, Bar, absolutely right. Uh, if something is just a, a uh, something wrong in the market, uh, an anomaly like that that can forecast returns, there's a strong market mechanism to remove it. That's that's the proof of returns shouldn't be forecastable. So, how do things last so long? Well. It is quite possible, if something represents a risk premium, then it can last. So the story I'm peddling for dividend yield predictability goes like this. There are good economic times when people are willing to take risks, because, you know, things look okay. Like, uh, right now, uh, this, our search for yield, uh, 2006 was similar. Uh, people look around and they say, ah, eh, you know, there's not much danger on the horizon. Uh, I'm willing to lever up. I'm willing to take a lot of risk. Yeah. Returns don't look so good, but you know what else am I going to do with money? Then we get to like December of 2008, <laughs> uh, you know, financial crisis, recession, the exact same risk. People look at that and say, "Oh my God, I can't afford 
there. They're about to repossess the cow and the dog. Um, uh, yes, uh, I, I see great return possibilities, but you know, right now I might lose my job tomorrow. I can't take the risk. So what do they do? The, the same asset, they're not willing to buy. The price has to go down a lot until willing people are willing. So if the people's willingness to hold the kind of risk varies over time, you're going to see the price going up and down, and you're going to see the expected return. And you will be able to say, yes, December 2008 is a buying opportunity. Expect the returns are high for people willing to take the risk. And why? Because so many other people are not willing to take the risk. Now, that, that's a nice story for dividend yields. And I, now, it's much harder to sell that story for momentum. Why is it that uh, you know stocks that went up last year seem to keep going up? <clears throat> when momentum was discovered in the early 1990s, lots of people, including me, said, "Great, that's one of those many many things come and go exactly in the way you said." Uh, a one week reversal seemed to be something that was there for a while. Quickly, a lot of hedge funds started doing it, disappeared. Uh, lots of things come and then disappear. Momentum didn't. Why is momentum a risk factor? That, there's the, the big puzzle. So lots of things do show up for a while, and then they get traded away, exactly as you say. Lots of things stay for a long time. In theory, that's OK if they are persistent risk factors. If to take those uh, advantages, you have to be willing to shoulder some risk that other people aren't willing to shoulder. Uh, and then the hard part that we're just beginning is seeing, is that true of the actual durable opportunities that we see? Uh, or, and that's the same problem for behavioral types. Uh, if it's truly behavioral, why are you so much smarter than everybody else? Uh, you know, that's something that human, some risk that human psychology doesn't want to take. Well, are, are you not human, too? Uh, oh, and then there was a second question. Unconditional needs. Yeah. Um, uh, so there's a lot of different means in what we do. There's a lot of averages. There's the expectation in people's heads of what's going to happen in the future. And uh, what we do is if, if we live in, you know, price is expectation of future dividend with what's in people's heads. And um, if people are rational, they can be wrong, but not systematically. So over long periods of time, on average, they should be right. And, and, and then so we're using rational expectations and stationarity to take a theory that says price is the expectation in people's heads of tomorrow's dividend to say that over long periods of time, the average price should be the average dividend. And then we use the sample mean to, to, to try to estimate that unconditional mean. So I did a very quick job of a very subtle uh, transformation from price is psychologically expected future, a uh, discounted future payoff down to conditional expectation down to unconditional expectation using rational expectations. Uh, can I do a better job? Or can one of you guys do a better job on that unconditional mean question? Mm, no. <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. Maybe, maybe we'll think about it and have something better to say. OK, next question is from Anonymous, who is a software engineer. And he's currently working for a bank in Chicago. Oh. I'm he said that he's very interested in quantitative equity portfolio management. And he has a question regarding investing uh, or trading models against asset price models. What's the difference and relationship between these two types of models? Uh, he says that he knows in practice people like to use asset pricing models to evaluate investing and trading models, anomalies, alpha, or risk premium. But if an asset pricing model have enough predictable predicting power, can we use it as an investing or trading model? Oh, boy, why do I have to have these deep, hard questions? <laughs> uh, so there's, there's, sort of a, there's, there's these big categories, trading models. So one category of trading model, the word trading model, means how do you buy stuff at minimizing price impact, bid-ask spread, and trading costs? That's a really important question, which we're not going to talk about at all. So we're not talking about that kind of trade model. Then uh, he got at a lot of um, what Adam was asking earlier, in some sense, on, on this whole spectrum between absolute pricing and relative pricing. Um, so let's think about, suppose you're, you're doing a trading model. And a, a typical example of a, a merged model someone might use is we're, we're going to look at buying securities. And then we're going to benchmark to the Fama French three-factor model. So those of you who don't know, that includes the market return. 
Uh, that includes um, uh, the value portfolio, ASML and, and SMB. And we're going to look for a trading model might mean looking for certain kinds of stocks that have higher returns than their market beta, HML and SMB beta might might uh, justify. Is that okay? Will you guys pass me on calling that a trading model? Now, now think about that, the use of that model and, and all the troubles that is. On the one hand, maybe it gives up on the first order question, how much value, how much small firm, and how much market beta should be, we, should, we should be using. In fact, you know, market, then there's this whole beta thing. Maybe the market beta part isn't right. I mean, maybe the first order question is, I should just be investing it in, in value or something. Then we find something. Now, you can tell what's going to be next. Uh, momentum. Momentum is something of alpha, I guess, the three-factor model. Well, does that mean that momentum goes over on the right-hand side as a factor? Or does that mean momentum is, is a trading strategy? Ah, right uh, Now, in some sense, we're, we're in this world where the, it's, it, it's a difficult question. Um, there's a famous case. I had a beer with a hedge fund manager, and I accused him that he didn't know anything. He just had like a seven-factor model that was value, growth, momentum, and carry trade. And he spilled his beer and said, of course, that's exactly what, what I have. That's my trading model, because none of my clients know what any of this stuff is or how to invest in it. Uh, and he was exactly right. I am in the Vegas. Th I don't know how to trade momentum. How do you trade momentum with lo lo losing everything in transactions costs? Which kind of momentum works? Do you want to use nine-month momentum, 12-month momentum, skip a month? I don't know. He does. And it's, it's worth his 2 and 23 to, to get that. So that's, that's a great example of something that's like kind of on the edge of is it a trading model or an asset pricing model? And, and, and how, you know, maybe we should quench, question what should be the best. If your client is invested only in the market and is a mean bear investor and doesn't know anything but the cap M, then the, 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 the cap M should be the asset pricing model and, and everything else counts as trading model. Uh, so uh, that's a deep, uh, I always end up with a long lecture and that's a deep question and I'm not answering it. Uh, but that is a deep question and just what are factors versus what are anomalies to trade? Uh, you know, as a, as a quantitative investor guy, he, he really ought to fight back and say, I, I want to call most of the stuff trading and not factor. <laughs> oh, you know, why benchmark me against stuff that you're not investing in? Okay, let's move on. That's the best I can do on that question. Thank you. Unless you guys have, you guys have to catch me when I say something wrong or stupid or over the top. No, I, I think on this discussion, it's important to, to keep in mind that in this class, we, we often focus on or you can't focus on why do these anomalies exist in the first place. But but that might not be, or maybe some people will say that that's not what we're interested in. We're only interested in finding anomalies and then trading on them. And I guess there's a one debate could be if you are trading, if you were working in a bank and you were trying to find patterns in the markets, should you worry about why the value premium exists or why the momentum exists? Should or you find something else in your black box or your machine learning, you find a pattern, isn't that enough in itself to, to make money from the market? Yeah, and let's, uh, I, I think it's very worth emphasizing the investor versus equilibrium perspective. Uh, there's the famous joke of, of uh, uh, Milton Friedman and George Stigler are the two famous Chicago economists. They're walking down the street and they see a $20, George sees a $20 bill on the sidewalk and says, Milton, look, a $20 bill on the sidewalk. And Milton says, oh, no, that can't be. If it were there, the market would have picked it up already. Um, and, and we're very much like that. Uh, what we're going to do in the class is we're going to see all sorts of anomalies, and we're going to work really hard to say, no, those aren't anomalies. Those are high expected returns that correspond to some kind of risk. Now, maybe they are and maybe they're not. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, I think the important thing is to develop some bullshit detectors, some uh, some some just hold on a minute, uh, you know, maybe maybe that isn't a $20 bill. The market should have picked it up. At least let's run through why, you know, you have some neural network that says some stock is great. Wait a minute. Have you just rediscovered momentum? Is that something you know already? Wait a minute. Have you just rediscovered value stock? Something is known, which might be a puzzle, but a known puzzle. Uh, wait a minute. Is that really risk corresponding to return? Um, I think that, so that's what we'll focus on. And, the, and at least it helps you to avoid falling into the errors of many uh, people before you. We're not going to focus a lot on ways to find extra anomalies. Nina? 
Yeah, I think that we in academia try to answer the question why is it like that. Yeah, and I think that's useful in industry. If you don't ask the question why, you end up doing stupid stuff like just buying high beta stocks and paying two and twenty for high beta stocks, or buying value stocks and paying two and twenty for something that you can get for next to free at Vanguard. So at least let's ask the question: Could it be risk and return? And I think that provides the discipline needed for successful uh, violations of risk and return, or at least thinking about everything is a risk. So let's just think about: Is this a risk that you're willing to hold? I mean, that's a useful thing to do. Maybe one more, and then we gotta go. Yep. The 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 last question then is is from Savio Cardoso. This is a slightly different question. He asks, "Hello, Professor Cochran. I have a slightly different question than my fellow classmates. He asks, you, "Can we postpone the start of the class by one week? And in addition, can you list recommended readings for week one? It would help me immensely if you can recommend any supplementary readings." That would bring me up to speed in differential equations, linear regression, calculus. Uh, that would be necessary background knowledge for, for taking this course. Um, I've bought your, your textbook, which is on your way, um, but I might not. Uh, but my sense tells me that I'll not find the background I need, in, uh, and, and it will be more advanced. I studied calculus, regression, etc., in engineering. That was 20 years ago. Uh, any guidance that you can provide will be most helpful, and any consideration uh, will be much appreciated. So, so I guess it, so. A, a general question about what's what's the background needed yeah. for this class. So we're not going to postpone anything because th those of you who aren't watching you know how how many, much long nights all four of us have spent changing links and making <laughs> the dates are set up right. But that's what Coursera is for, you know. Take it at the level you want to take it. If it gets too hard, uh, you know, just watch the videos and take it again next year. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea at this point to start reading calculus books, and that's what Coursera is for. There must be a hundred good calculus uh, Coursera things on there. I mean, why be, uh, you know, why be old-fashioned like me and read things out of books? You know, uh, you know Google it up. Uh, most of it's self-contained. So I don't have any good recommendations for prior study because I like you guys have more recent books than I do. But I don't think I, I think uh, you know take a look at, at what's here and then you got to find uh, the, the resources to get what you need. It's not that hard, and uh, so I'm just going to say no and good luck. <laughs> yeah, my suggestion would be to use forum if you feel stuck. I think that the other students are very helpful so far, and. Um, I also would do my best if I see that uh, the question is remains unanswered. No, absolutely. Let, let, this is a community thing, so jump on the forums. And I do want to emphasize that to everybody. Uh, with the quizzes, with the homeworks, okay, <clears throat> please don't give out answers, but it, certainly ask and help each other. There's no advantage to anyone in staring at something and not knowing what it's about. Uh, so, so uh, I've got these two wonderful TAs, and I'll look at the forums as well. We got a whole world of people working on this stuff. Let's work together because usually it's not usually. Mean is exactly right. Studying math is not the answer. It's not in some textbook somewhere. And usually the math isn't the answer. Usually it's something very simple and conceptual. You didn't understand that you needed to take the derivative with respect to r rather than take the derivative with respect to x. Uh, you didn't understand what went on the left and what went on the right. It's not about how to take a derivative. And that's what that's what the forums and discussion are, are about. That's why this is so much better than just reading a book. Okay, with that, uh, thank you everybody, and I'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.